Hi, Margaret. Um, this PowerPoint presentation is Chapter 6 in my book. Um, you could see that it talks about some of the setup for the stuff you're working on now. So um, I think some of this might have been on your last test, but things about light, photons, um, line spectra, um, quantization, um, and then we get into orbitals and spin. So this lecture will be me talking about my slides, and then I think I'll come up with some problems, and then I'll get my Chapter 7 slides ready for you to see at some point. Um, you probably recall that a lot of these um, letters don't come across properly in this font, so I'll be writing um, some of these things. So these Greek letters, lambda and nu, represent um, wavelength and frequency. Um, the units of frequency are inverse seconds. The units of wavelength are usually meters. Sometimes if you're given a different unit, you can convert it to meters. Um, the speed of light is always a constant. And when we call light electromagnetic radiation, it's because of the two fields that are propagating through the air naturally. So you have an electric field and a magnetic field that are separated by 90 degrees. And essentially, it's just like pulsed energy with high amplitude uh, going up or low amplitude going down. But um, over time, this energy just propagates uh, forward through space. Um, if the wavelength is very narrow, well, then the frequency is high. So if you have a small wavelength, you have a large frequency. Let's take a look at this light just to show you that um, visible light, the kind that we see, um, ranges from approximately, let's say, 750 nanometers is the wavelength. That's a longer wavelength than blue light, which is around 400 nanometers. And um, both of all of these waves that you see on the slide are going at the same speed. The um, distance between the crests is what's different. And therefore, um, because the speed is constant, um, this is going to have a larger wavelength, and the, so therefore a smaller frequency. The blue light has a shorter wavelength, so it's going to have a larger frequency. Remember that frequency has units of inverse seconds. So there are more waves passing a point per second if it's blue light than the red light. Um, amplitude for light has to do with the uh, height of the, or brightness of the light. So you can imagine um, like a tiny little Christmas light, um, just that's red and it's kind of flickering and it's really kind of hard to see maybe from a long way away. Um, that will have the same wavelength as, let's say, a red laser pointer. Um, but the um, laser pointer has a much higher amplitude. Um, it's actually going to have more energy. Later, we'll talk about the concept of photons, um, and that is kind of connected to this as well. Um, on this slide, you could see that the visible light that we see is just a small sliver of the whole electromagnetic spectrum. Recall that I mentioned the um, long wavelength is red, and the short wavelength is blue and purple. And on the short wavelength side of visible light um, are ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. Um, we'll see a little bit later on that shorter wavelength also goes with high energy or large frequency. On the long wavelength side, like infrared, microwaves, and radio frequency, those are low energy kinds of light with um, smaller frequencies. Um, when you say that something behaves as a wave, and when you take physics, you'll be studying this more in detail, but this is just a key word to associate in your mind with a wave. 
So on the left-hand side, you could see like this water pool, and you could put like tuning forks in here or to, uh, a rod that's vibrating, and you could see how the waves come together and they add together. We call that adding, I'm sure you know this, constructive and destructive interference. Constructive interference and a destructive interference. What this means is that if you could look at this um, water from the side, there would be waves that are larger um, out here where the waves add up than when they start out, and that's because of constructive interference. Um, there would also be places where when the waves hit, they cancel. So that's a physical example, something that you could see in the real world. It's a physical example of this concept of diffraction. That's, again, interference. Um, a light version of that can be seen here. For example, if you shot two, if you shot light through two holes in, let's say, um, a wall, on the opposite side of the wall, if you put film, you would see some of the places would be exposed. That's this black lines. That's where um, the light hit it. And then there'd be other parts of the film that were white, that were not hit. Meaning that um, this pattern, this is where constructive interference occurs. The crests of the waves that added together, like from this picture, are hitting the wall and, or hitting the film and exposing it. But where the waves cancel, the, the film is not exposed at all. So the reason that this slide is important is because it shows you two different examples of the process of diffraction. You can see it in a physical example that you can see, like water, or you can see it in an invisible um, kind of light. Both of these are something that behaves as a way. Um, in the history of this kind of science, there was a very strange phenomenon that seemed, I should say, it seemed strange when people tried to understand it. So um, they don't correspond to waves in the real world. Unlike water waves, which clearly have the energy of the wave connected to the amplitude, with electromagnetic radiation, we enter a weird world. A solid object in its visible light when it's heated, this is called black body radiation. So you can see this um, electric heating element or an old-fashioned light bulb. Both of these things are very hot, and they put out light. Okay? The color of the light depends on the temperature change. Color is related to wavelength and frequency, and we know that temperature was related to energy because if you heat the piece of metal, it will glow red uh, corresponding to some temperatures and maybe it'll glow blue compared to others or white. Uh, that's what this is trying to show here, that at lower temperatures you see a different maximum that's observed. So you actually can heat something and it seems red hot, then it turns to bluish, and then it could be white hot where all the temperatures all the colors are emitted. This guy, Max Planck, proposed that, in order to understand this, he proposed that energy was actually being emitted from the glowing objects in these sort of particles of light called quanta. And that the energy of each quanta was a constant times whatever the frequency of the light is. And that the total amount of energy had to be some integer number of quanta that's coming out. So, in other words, this sort of made the idea that light behaves as a wave, it seemed to be a contradiction. Because a wave looks continuous. I mean, it goes, it sort of pulses high and low, high and low. But this looks like individual bits of energy, which doesn't seem to make sense, but that's the way that the experiments seem to behave. So this was Planck's constant. He said that the energy of each quanta was related to whatever its frequency was. 
And since we know from our equations about frequencies connected to wavelength, you could create a, an equation that combines both of the equations that I mentioned. So as the frequency of light increases, the energy of the photon increases. If the wavelength of the light increases, the energy goes down. I had mentioned earlier with the rainbow that red light has energy than blue light. So this is the quantum theory of energy that Max Planck was very, very responsible for. Any object can emit or absorb only certain quantities of energy. Energy is quantized. It occurs in fixed quantities rather than being continuous. Each quantity of energy is called a quantum. An atom changes its energy state by emitting or absorbing one or more quanta of energy. Now this is really here. The change in the energy of some system is going to be some integer times h nu, um, where n can only be a whole number. So this is basically saying if you have some hot coals here, and they're emitting red light, there are an integer number of quanta. that are being emitted from the hot coals. This experiment is somewhat similar to the black body radiation because it involves this idea that energy can be thought of as individual particles. And notice how I'm drawing these little boxes here. Um, I want you to think of a shiny piece of metal. That's what this is, inside a vacuum. It was demonstrated that if you shine some light on the metal, you could cause sparks only if the value of H nu was large enough. Oops. Um, there, basically, that there's something called a threshold energy. And so is since we know H nu is related to energy, um, basically larger energy photons work like ultraviolet, but low energy photons don't work. Like visible, like visible light, visible or IR, which is something that you know already. You don't take a piece of metal, put it out in the sun, and then it starts sparking. That's what this electron flying off is. You need higher energy photons, like ultraviolet light, that really cause a reaction like this. This is a different slide that says the same thing. You could read this on your own. But look how there's a critical frequency that needs to be reached. So this is saying that if the light that comes in doesn't have that frequency, nothing will happen. Eventually, you will reach the point, if you keep increasing the frequency and you pass through a magic point, bingo. Then you're going to start getting photons jumping off. Um, if you uh, have the light that has higher intensity, you could uh, kick off more photons. So this was another type of experiment that was not understood by the scientists at the late 1800s. Um, this is line spectra. Line spectra were observed when you took a light bulb with only a certain type of gas inside. So that it's really called a gas discharge tube. So when you have hydrogen gas, they observed that the light came off was kind of this light purple put through a prism there were only four lines that were observed and that seemed really weird whereas if you took the sun and put it through a prism you would get a full rainbow you know you wouldn't just get um, I'm just kind of using my technologies here Um, you would get a full rainbow. Why do you only get lines? There's a 
big mystery. Um, what made the mystery even more mysterious was that different um, gas discharge tubes also produce lines, but they produce different patterns of lines. When quanta became part of the conversation among scientists, they suspected that it had something to do with this. A Dutch teacher named Rydberg noticed that the pattern of the spacings of the lines could be reproduced by fitting combinations of integers into a rather simple equation. And boy, oh boy, this really translated this weird. So this is 1 over lambda is equal to 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared, where n2 has to be greater than n1. Um, if n1 is equal to 2, then you would see visible light. Or a line, visible light, visible light line seen. If n1 is equal to 1, you would see ultraviolet light. The thing that Rydberg noticed, though, look at these spacings. Look how these spacings are kind of big, and then they bunch up to each other. This is a bigger spacing than this spacing. This is a bigger spacing than this spacing. This pattern is what led him to this equation. Cross those off. <laughs> and um, you have to be kind of a maybe a math dude to notice this kind of thing. But the fact that it's still lines, what really was fascinating to people. Um, what Bohr predicted was happening, or proposed, that's why we call it a model, Bohr proposed that the hydrogen atom only had certain energy levels. So he applied the idea that quantization was running things. He called them stationary states. He said each state is associated with a fixed circular orbit of the electron, kind of like planets around the sun. Now, we've learned since then that that's not actually true. However, the rest of it is kind of true. Electrons at higher energy orbitals, or higher energy levels, tend to be further than the nucleus, than the ones with the lower energy levels. When the electron is in the very first state, he called it the ground state. The atom does not radiate energy while it's in a stationary state, but it does emit energy when it transfers from one state to another. This is a helpful picture. You could think of an atom almost like a quantum staircase. Bohr's idea of the atom allows that the absorption of energy causes excitation. So this is, again, this is what we mean by excitation. A or an atom can be um, kind of boring in the ground state, but if light comes along, or heat, or some kind of energy, you could make an ex excitation happen and end up in the second level, or the third level, or the fifth level, for example. Um, the excited state lasts only for a certain period of time. Usually a short period. And then these states fall back down. Now notice how the electron is almost like if you had a bunch of golf balls that you rolled off the top of the stairs. Some of the balls might hit every stair. Some of the balls might skip stairs. What Bohr proposed was that each transition going down gave off light. And this light is basically called a photon. Um, this is a really where you should fix your attention. As I mentioned a little earlier, the planetary picture that the left part of the slide shows is not really true. Because electrons don't live just on specific, like, nice circular orbitals. But this picture is nice because it illustrates, again, why you get different kinds of light waves when the um, atom, when the hydrogen atom is emitting. So again, this is an H atom emission spectrum. 
Any of the transitions down to the n equals 1 are long ultraviolet, uh, I should say high energy ultraviolet photons. Infrared photons are smaller energy. And so remember that equation before when I did this? I had a constant. Oops. Whatever numbers you put in here, you're going to get a different line. Um, whoops. So a different line a different line results from um, a unique combination of integers. That's what these each arrow transitions for. The Rydberg equation can be re-expressed in terms of a difference in energy between levels by using this tabletop analogy. This is saying that the difference in energy between two levels is going to be the difference between a final and initial. And that's going to be equal to a different constant, this one 2.18 times n to minus 18 over 1 over n1 squared minus n2 squared. So this is just an energy version of the earlier equation. Flame tests and fireworks are real-life examples of emissions of visible light. You can see that these different elements give different colors. And it's because their pattern of lines is going to be different than hydrogen. So you might have a pattern like that. And so the wavelength that you see might be different. Um, spectrophotometry, uh, this is actually an error here. did this in lab last week, and I suspect you'll probably do it too. In Chem 101 lab, we get the experience of measuring the light that gets absorbed by a sample. A quantity called the absorbance is directly proportional to the concentration of the absorbing species. So the absorbance gets put on the y-axis, and then the x-axis is the concentration of whatever solution you have. And you get a slope that's equal to this term, epsilon b. b is the cell path length. And epsilon is a characteristic of um, each species that's absorbing light. It's called um, an extinction coefficient. When you see something that has a certain color, so here we have a green leaf. The reason you see green is because some of the other colors get absorbed. So if you're absorbing this red and the yellow, the, the colors that basically get reflected back to your eye are like the green and the yellow. Um, if you were going to, let's say, want, if you were going to make a solution of chlorophyll and um, picking the light at 663 is going to be good because this ends up being proportional to how much um, chlorophyll you have in your sample. So I say, so now that we have a bit of a handle of the nature of light, one might ask if particles themselves have any odd properties in the quantum world. The answer is yes. I said, this can get deep, but a lot of work in the beginning of the 20th century revealed that matter and energy have a very close connection. All matter exhibits properties of both particles and waves. Electrons have wave-like motion and therefore only certain allowable energies and frequencies. The, um, the wavelength of any particle is um, proportional to the inverse of the speed 
and the inverse of the mass. Um, wave motion gets complicated, and I noticed that this PowerPoint presentation is 43 slides. I think I'm going to stop here and pick up with it later.